Uh, I hope you can still see my um, my screen. Yes. Um, Sophie Jambon is from uh, AstraZeneca, a French citizen, but moved uh, to the UK in 2004 for her PhD at the School of Engineering, uh, Chemical Engineering and Analytical Sciences at the University of Manchester in the well-known group of Professor Roger Davy. Her uh, research topic was understanding crystallization pathways from thermotropic liquid crystalline states. She started as a senior crystallization scientist at AstraZeneca in December 2007. And her main activity was to develop robust crystallization processes for APIs to provide suitable crystalline form and particle properties for downstream processes, including efficient isolation, drying, formulation development, and drug product manufacture. This engineer, the physical attributes are to ensure patients are supplied with consistent and safe investigational medicines. She was promoted in 2017 to associate principal scientist in crystallization uh, science and then became a team manager in 2018 in the early development phase from pre lead optimization to phase 2B. Her team consists of specialists, including biocatalysis, crystallization science, material particle science, and process engineering. Sophie, thank you very much for joining us today and uh, sharing your experience uh, with our instruments, with the Crystal 16, uh, together with our um, attendees. I'm making you now a presenter. I think you should be able to share your screen with us. Yes, we see the slides. Brilliant. So I'm going to show them in a presentation mode. Yep. And use a little window. Is that good? Perfect. So, uh, Hello everyone. Um, so thank you very much for this kind introduction, Carmen, and thank you very much as well for the opportunity to speak today. Um, so I, um, I think I want to focus that presentation on on things which have some way already been mentioned by the previous speakers. So thank you for the introduction um, to the uh, to the other speaker. That was really good. Um, but I will focus uh, also a lot on the how to get accurate, reliable, and repeatable data using Crystal 16, and how that equipment has been embedded in our ways of working. And I think when you presented uh, me, Carmen, you said that I was working in parallel phase two, phase two B, and in these kind of phases, we've got very little material. I mean, we're scrapping barrels sometimes, we've got mix, so Crystal 16 is a perfect platform to get a lot of data with very limited amount of material. And I hope you will understand how you can get valuable data uh, with a wonderful equipment. Um, and, and I'm hoping that my presentation, in addition to the one of the other speaker, will have shown you that nicely. So I will focus on what is Crystal 16, which I think I'm not going to spend too much time because we all know what it is, otherwise we will not be there. Uh, I will show you some experimental consideration, which has been mentioned in previous talks, but just want to give you a bit more detail to what can happen to your data. And as it's been said, always look a bit at the vial um, before just taking the, the, the data as face value. Uh, how CRISPR-16 is embedded in our uh, specialty crystallization development stage, uh, but uh, solid state investigation. And then I will conclude. So, I think we all know what crystal 16, but just to give a bit of a, uh, making sure we all on the same page, is a 16 small reactor instrument with control agitation and temperature and with a pad capability, which is basically an institute turbidity monitoring pro, uh, system, sorry. Um, for me, it's an ideal instrument for solid state and crystallization investigation, especially when you are limited with material and that has been presented nicely in previous talks. I have represented the vial of crystal 16 through these pictures here, and you can see that what you're trying to measure most likely is basically a slurry with a, a, a turbidity measurement of the light going through the slurry. You've got the I1 in that, uh, in that slurry, which might be much lower than I0 because you're losing the light. And in when I0 in that uh, environment, when it's a solution, then it goes through the, the sample um, much brighter to 100%. Um, transmission. So you, in that case, you can see that I2 is much higher than I1. So that's basically the basic of the 
turbidity uh, measurement. So uh, I'm not going too much into uh, how we applied uh, CRISPR-16 and how to use CRISPR-16 because I think Yupa has done a very nice job on showing that through his, uh, his graph in, in his uh, last slide. And there are some papers you can see. I have listed non-exhaustive list, obviously, because Carmen said there are lots of other papers. But you can see that there are a few papers which I would recommend, and most of them are actually written by Yupa de Host. So thank you so much. And here I gave a very quick overview of the application. So um, you, as has been done said, said several times, you can measure solubility uh, and basically start uh, developing your solubility, start building your solubility curve. You can measure metastable zone width. You can do uh, short, medium, or long-term slurries to check how your solid will uh, will behave with time in that particular solvent. You can um, make or prepare single crystals. You can look at competitive slurries when you look at different stability of different forms. You can do some crystallization, initial crystallization experiment, and you can do some nucleation rate and nucleation time, as Yup's their host presentation, which was really clear on that. Um, there are many advantages, which has been uh, said already, but what I want to say is very robust instrument. Uh, we've got the first generation one, which is over 14 years. Um, so it's not that one. It's one of the pictures from Carmen. Um, and it's still actually working perfectly well. You cannot believe that we still have it and it's still bang on and it's still really reliable piece of kit. And in some ways, I don't want to get it away. I call it the granny. I love it. So stable, um, so reliable, amazing. What I really like also, it's small footprint in the lab. So in our film cupboard, it actually takes a very tiny space, just half of the film hood, so we can we can do other things on the side. Um, what I like is also the software is very user friendly. So when we uh, train people uh, first time to use the kit, then easily they get really acquainted and they feel comfortable with uh, with very half an hour of training, which makes then generation data a lot better. And uh, and as I said earlier. Ideal, especially for early phase when you're limited with materials, because with a one mil vial, you can do so much. So I'm just going to focus a bit uh, on four main consideration when you think about uh, this the experimental setup uh, and the uh, and basically running an experiment on Crystal 16, because even though it's a very robust um, a piece of kit, you need to think about uh, the preparation of your samples. And then how that sample behave then uh, during your experiment. So first of all, it's really key to have an homogeneous slurry because if you have large crystal and small crystals or basically big crystals, then you end up sometimes having this kind of reading, which is very hard then to decide where is your what is the final turbidity, when is your cleaving point, as uh, mentioned by Yves de Horst, about when uh, when you're basically eating slowly, when is the point your transmission gone from zero? To 100%. Um, so then your data become very noisy and it's very hard to, to pinpoint that specific uh, clear point. So I think what I would recommend to everyone is before preparing any samples, look at the powder you're, you're going to, uh, to use and make sure you gently grind it. Um, I, I like because I put gently twice just to make sure it's, it's done gently because you never know you can have a form transformation as you're grinding it. Sometimes mechanical strength on a solid may change your form. So you have to check also by XRP pre and post and grinding when you're still dealing with the same form and you're still going to measure the solubility of the form you put in your vial. Uh, consideration two, I think that has been also mentioned, is basically a crown or cross formation above a liquid level. Um, therefore, what you measure is actually the, the, the black line rather than the dotted line. So you're losing solid in your solution. Um, so you're measuring um, a higher solubility than it is. Um, if I, I hope I got it right, sometimes I need to think. Um, so it's basically a loss of material in the eight space, um, and you're very, therefore your concentration in your vial is lower than what you thought initially. I think the main thing is just to check your vial, that was mentioned, but also to repeat the experiment. Um, and you can use, but that's very fiddly, try to measure by gravimetry how much matter you lose to the to the crowd. But that can be a, a fiddly activity, especially at, at elevated temperature, try to, to make it, to do it in an accurate way. 
Consideration three, I think it's really important to understand the system or the solid system you're trying to uh, evaluate there of a compound uh, because form change can occur during the experiment. Um, clearing point not always relevant to form when you've been inputting. So you can see that you can have a, a blue form you start and then at the end of the, of the heating you can have actually a yellow. Or during basically the old stage at 20 is changing. Um, so I think main thing is really to understand the solid form landscape of your for, of your compound of interest. Um, you can also be also um, um, get a system which can be an anthropotropic system. So the same polymorph, um, different polymorph, sorry, but with um, be changing with temperature, the stability uh, switching basically. Um, so defining a form transformation diagram before doing any kind of experiment can be very useful. You cannot always do it, but it's good to have at least an appreciation of it. So obviously you can see that the blue may be, uh, may be a lower solubility and then your, your amber will be um, a higher solubility. So it's really important to understand the form transformation diagram here. Consideration four, I think it's really important also to use quite high purity samples um because some chemists come with like sample of 95 percent purity and i'm like yeah i'm not sure uh, what we are dealing here um so you can have a change in your in your clearing point again and sometimes if that uh, um, impurity is actually not soluble at all then you end up basically seeing nothing when you should actually be seeing some clearing point of your epi of interest so it's it's really important so i would always try to go to highest purity as practically possible or when you go there and you try the experiment if you have things which are a bit weird understanding uh, making sure you've got that value of purity so that gives you a bit of uh, some ideas of what we've experienced um, within uh, within az and why and how we prepare samples and how we think when we prepare samples um, so we don't take just the data as face value we really criticize and make sure that those data feel reliable so now I'm going to focus a bit on how that equipment is embedded in our ways of working. So we do quite a lot on solid state investigation to understand the solid form landscape, designing the form transformation diagram, as mentioned before. Uh, and we do also some crystal, single crystal generator using the Crystal 60. In terms of uh, crystallization development aspect, we do a lot of solubility measurement. We do some part of crystallization process outline, and we've actually embedded Crystal 16 as part of our crystallization workflow. Uh, the main thing is before going anywhere near crystallization development, it's really key to understand a bit more your solid state uh, and how many different forms that compound wants to exhibit. So what you are trying to make, basically. So in terms of solid state investigation, uh, we work with our, I mean, I am in the crystallization team, and I work with a solid state group, and uh, we were very closely to, uh, to understand a bit more uh, what's happening to the compound of interest. And they are the ones basically running the short, medium or long term uh, slurries, as well as competitive slurries, just to have an appreciation on how the compound will behave in different solvent at different temperature. In that environment, you may not need fully really the, the turbidity monitoring, it can help sometimes to, 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 uh, to identify a form change when you got a dissolution and a recrystallization, but it's, it's always very important to check the XRP pre and post slurries. Um, so then you can identify, as I said, an anthropotropic system because you've got a very good uh, temperature system control in that uh, equipment. You can check solvate, hydrates, and other forms. Um, and in terms of making alternative forms, uh, as has been said, you can also try to see if you can make salt or co-crystal at this scale, which is really useful. Um, in terms of over solid state investigation, as I said, I, we, do, we do single crystal generator. So uh, this time again, not really a requirement for turbidity monitoring, not really a requirement for agitation because we try to keep the solution uh, very fixed and stable, but we use temperature cycling and slow cooling ROM to try to promote uh, first nucleus and try to grow that nucleus slowly with time. Um, so it's it's a, it's a very powerful uh, tool to, to, to do that. Um, now I'm going to focus a bit more uh, uh, about the crystallization framework and uh, where basically the crystal 16, but also it's a big brother, the crystalline basically fit in our workflow. 
So we've got three main steps. Uh, these are just to give you a good, uh, a, a good basically um, set of experiments to, to really gain confidence about your process going forward uh, in scale and, uh, and, uh, and to, uh, to basically deliver the drugs to patients. So first one step is basically solubility measurement and solvent selection. The requirement when we're using crystal 16 is basically less than a gram, and we can do 20 experiments with 50 mg, which is a very good setup. Then we do process outline, which from the solubility measurement, we can then get we can then design or think about which type of uh, solvent system is appropriate and uh, what will be the temperature in which we can basically crystallize our compound. So one tough uh, equation was mentioned, uh, but it will be kind of a similar thing. And develop the, the solubility curve and from there get the data you need to uh, design your process. And then we go to the process online when we test that process uh, at small scale. So we tend to use a bit more material because we start using sometimes crystalline, but if we don't have a choice, we go back to crystal 16 and then we use, uh, we, uh, we do it there, especially more for cooling than anti-solvent, to be honest. And finally, when we've used, when we've got a a bit more appreciation of how the process outline or what are the different steps of the process should look like, we go in, in the process exploration where we try to really test the process a bit more to understand the kinetics of nucleation and growth and, and, and what kind of particle shape we get and how we, the impurity are rejected and do we get a good throughput, a good yield and a, and a good sustainable process. And it's where we use a bit more and then we use a lot more crystalline um, in the early phase over larger reactors uh, and then therefore we can use other PAT uh, probes like we've been mentioned, FBRM, but we use also Blaze Matrix, Easy Viewer. Uh, we can go to a uh, lot of particle tracking uh, probe, but that's not the topic of this talk. So step one is basically solubility measurement and solvent selection. So I think basically solubility measurement, as has been mentioned, is focusing on the clearing point measurement at at different temperature and especially elevated temperature. So it's kind of difficult to measure solubility at elevated temperature in um, in like a, a, a just one system block and then you have to try to to get your, you separate your liquors from your solid and that can be very difficult to, to, to keep the integrity of your solution at elevated temperature when you isolate things at 20 degrees Celsius. So that's a very very positive things about crystal 16 is we can actually easy to measure that uh, that clearing point or closer to the solubility. So it's very key to understand the known mass of compound and the known volume uh, and then a very slow eating rate. So it's been mentioned that definitely the faster you go, the higher your, your clearing point. So it's really important to keep it very slow. Um, and I put 0 .0, 0 0.3 degrees Celsius per minute as a, as a bulk number. Um, but the, the lower, the slower, the better. For my experience, um, I've tried cycling and some compounds did not react properly. They just spontaneously crystallized and the, 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 the entire vial set solid material were everywhere stuck on the wall. And then you get a reading which is not as, if it, as, as accurate in the second cycle, but that depends on compound as well. So it's kind of, uh, um, I think a personal preference in that one. Um, then when we've done the solubility measurement, we tend also to try to get the metastable zone wave measurement. Um, we get that just to appreciate where we can seed, uh, but uh, we need to make sure that we understand that that data is definitely kinetically driven by your cooling rate, the type of stirrer, or the quality of the input. Uh, so representativeness is an interesting point in, uh, in pharmaceutical industry in the early phase as well, because you've got different impurities depending on how the material has been made. Um, so that's always a, a, a good uh, discussion we've got with chemists. Uh, from my experience as well, many of the pharmaceutical relevant compounds exhibit a large metastable zone with, I think I encounter twice in my life, um, and it's 14 years or so. I am happy to be in a challenge um, uh, where the, the metastable zone was actually very, very small. So the main outcome of this work is really to identify solvent or solvents for crystallizing the compound of interest. And ideally, yes, we are definitely focused on getting an anti, uh, sorry, a cooling crystallization. 
uh, just because it's so much easier. I say I didn't say easy. I say easier. It's very important to to scale up the process and to try to control a bit the uh, physical attributes of the API. So we tend to look for low solubility at 10 to 20 degrees Celsius, around 5 to 20 degrees, 20 mix per mil, and then more at 100 mix per mil at elevated temperature. These are basically bulk numbers. Obviously, it's not. Um, it's 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 a nice to have, but it's not always possible to get. So it's it's really a, a appreciating um, what you need uh, for your process. So the process outline. When we've got really limited material, yes, we tend to use Crystal 16. If we don't, then we use the big brother of a more advanced Crystal 16. I call it also crystalline. So we've got a larger volume uh, in terms of path. We've got a bit more. Um, a bit more, uh, would you call that, um, tools because you've got turbidity, but also cameras and Raman uh, facility. It's nice also because we've got over at Stira. So as I said, we have the first generation of Crystal 16 and the first generation of Crystal 16 doesn't have actually over at Stira. Uh, so it's quite nice to be able to have over at Stira's in a, in a larger, in a bigger vial. And uh, we've recently acquired uh, the second generation of Crystal 16 um, but I haven't yet used it. So it's on my to-do list to learn on using that one. What I really like also about Crystalline is it's got different caps for different experiment settings, so anti-solvent, evaporation, and distillation. So you can really evaluate a bit better, a bit more different uh, processes. Uh, and as I said, just process outline, you can really evaluate a, a good range. Uh, the main outcome of this work is really to identify the most suitable process uh, based on form, particle, and yield. Um, so obviously, you're not going to do a very thorough assessment on, on the particle because that will do also at, at a later stage on a on larger scale. But you get a good grasp on how controllable your form is, form is as long as the form landscape is not too complicated because uh, we're not going to the detail of that, but sometimes it can be challenging. Uh, and then uh, the yield also. Finally, the step three is basically still in more advanced Crystal 16 we use, uh, most likely, or even larger scale, um, because uh, we, if we have more material, then it's, it's better to use larger scale to really have an appreciation of what can happen uh, at, EU, at more production scale, basically. The other steer is critical in that uh, for understanding the particle properties. Um, so we'll have different representativeness of input, so different input to evaluate how the, the process will react, how the process will behave, different kinetics with different input, and also the outcome will be different with different particular size or shape. So in that one, we will definitely still monitor the yield to make sure that the yield is not impacted by the kinetics. We check the form, we look and evaluate a bit more of the different particles we can get with different uh, uh, process parameters, and also how the, the, the process rejects the impurities. It's this really is this process exploration step. It's where we spend most time. It's really to refine and enhance, enhance process understanding and make sure that when we scale it up, we've got a lot more appreciation on how we can mitigate risks uh, at scale. So I've, I've shown you basically the three steps uh, we, we're using to, uh, to develop uh, crystallization processes uh, um, in our um, team. Uh, but I think the, the main challenges around process development is often material limitation and material representativeness. Uh, also time constraint. Um, it's funny how now things are really uh, the faster the better. So you need to get a lot of data quickly. So um, it's really important to, to, to keep on the top of uh, making sure you've, you're not running after the trend, but you are on the side of the trend and you still can manage um, the, the project demand. Um, I think it's also uh, uh, think of it, thinking about scale-up assessment, because when you are in, uh, changing the, the scale, what's going to happen to your process or to the kinetic of your process, and that can touch also the equipment because then you're changing also the impeller, so you're changing your mixing profile. Again, touch up on the kinetics. Um, you have to think also about the isolation and drying, because a Buckner is kind of gentle on the particle, but when you use a pressure filter or centrifuge, you're putting a lot more uh, mechanical strength on those particles. Are they going to break, or are they going to remain intact and retain their, 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 their crystallization shape, if, uh, if that's a word? 
Um, and I must admit, since since my 14 years in AstraZeneca, somehow molecules are more complex, more challenging. Um, good challenge. Uh, I love a good challenge. Um, and also larger molecule uh, molecule weight. So I have touched uh, that took, uh, and I didn't say at the start, but that took is really focused on small organic molecule. But recently we've uh, encountered larger chemical entities. Um, so like uh, like maybe uh, uh, oligos or peptides. So we are basically really touching upon new new uh, aspect of crystallization. Um, so it's, it means that we have still a lot to learn and a lot to go and lots of challenges going on. So it's really good. And in all that challenges, I thought that, yes, it's been mentioned versatile. Yes, crystal 16 and crystal are versatile and have been paramount for us to quickly design innovative solution to challenging molecules. So um, on that note, I'm just going to uh, finish my talk. Um, uh, just to come back to this versatility uh, uh, word, to the sturdiness and the robustness of the instrument and its simplicity to be to, to use, basically, because anyone can use it. Um, I just give you some consideration to think of, uh, just to watch out and, and make sure you understand the, the data you're actually creating and acquiring. Uh, and to make sure that they are relevant of your system, they are accurate and they are reliable. I've shown you also how that has been embedded now into our workflows. And uh, and I think there are future perspectives. It's like, could we add more Vibrant 16? Uh, could we add cameras like in the crystalline? And I was thinking just to come to come up with inhomogeneous slurries or the crown, can we actually look at two points measurement for each vibe? Um, but this is a great piece of kit, 16 years, sweet 16, happy birthday, Crystal 16. And um, I'm just going to finish on acknowledging all my work colleagues, um, all the ones which have been helping me since my time, actually at Sanofi Montpellier in 2003, if I remember well. Um, and uh, so I know Olivier Monique very well, and they have been enabling me to, a bet, to be a better scientist, all of you, so thank you so much. Sanofi and AstraZeneca, and thank you for listening and hope you have any questions. I'm happy to answer. Thank you very much, Sophie. Really nice uh, uh, presentation and uh, thank you for sharing so much uh, uh, information about the Crystal 16 and also uh, about the, the, the crystalline. Really nice how uh, indeed how these instruments, uh, they blend into each other. Um, as a scientist myself, uh, I always started to, uh, with the crystal 16 and ended up with the crystalline uh, along the workflow. Um, and as we are a continuous uh, innovation company, who, who knows in the coming years where we are going to talk about. Um, Thank you also for those considerations and tips. We always uh, um, here we have a, an ear, if I can say that, to what our customers and our users uh, uh, mentioned to us. Um, thank you very much uh, for this. Uh, amazing how many applications uh, the Crystal 16 uh, has. And uh, because you, you, you have mentioned about the crystalline, uh, and I was just thinking uh, uh, now, the crystalline, uh, it was bought, uh, brought on the market in 2009. So we can imagine they are already 12 years. Uh, time is passing when we are having fun in the lab, right? <laughs> yeah, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you very much, Sophie, once again. Thank you all. Your Olivier, Ivan, uh, and uh, my apologies for um, a bumpy start. Um, the firewall at uh, Pfizer didn't like that much uh, the go to webinar platform. Uh, we will make sure we have a recording uh, uh, with a better sound uh, available on our uh, website and on our YouTube channel. You will all receive an. Uh, um, a link to to these uh, uh, recordings. Uh, stay tuned. It is just the beginning of this uh, sweet 16. I like how you mentioned it, uh, Sophie. Um, we have a year of celebrations and uh, surprises coming uh, um, in the next month. Once again, thank you all.
happy birthday Christo 16 and uh, to many more from now on and uh, stay safe all.